Okay, äh, Silligurke hier, willkommen auf Lasergurkenland, erreichbar unter der Domain sillihuhn.com, alternativ unter der IP-Adresse 149.202.127.134. Ähm, ja, wir sind hier immer noch am Traveln, obwohl ich mich bald gerne niederlassen würde. Ähm, ich würde gerne so eine Höhle haben, aber nicht an einem Schneeberg. Ähm, ja, ich, äh, ich weiß, das ist ein bisschen picky, aber ja, yeah, that's, that's what you got. Ich meine, ich kann ja mit der Crab-Rüstung auch noch ein bisschen rumlaufen, ohne Helm. Ähm, das geht noch eine Weile. Genau, und heute haben wir einen ähm, außergewöhnlichen Talk. Mal wieder. Ähm... Und zwar etwas von dem James Panakiuli. Ach du Scheiße, das heißt, also das spricht man sich ja anders aus. Ähm, Channel. Ähm, und auf dem Channel von dem lieben James haben wir einen Talk über. Oh! Äh, über Concise GNU Bash, an Introduction to Advanced Usage. Von äh, James selber. Das ist der Talk, sein Channel, sein. Talk auf dem Linux Fest von äh, Northwest Nord <coughs> North 2017. Ähm, ja, genau. Und äh, Link ist wie immer in der Beschreibung. IP-Adresse zu diesem Minecraft-Server ist auch in der Beschreibung. Ähm, dann würde ich sagen, without further ado, let's go. Ähm, Hi, good turnout. Thank you all for coming. See some tinfoil hats in the room. That's encouraging. Uh, I hope you're mm. here to learn about Bash. I hope you've seen Bash before because I'm not gonna start super basic. And uh, if you haven't read the man page, hopefully this will be a reasonable substitute or at least inspire you to do so. I also hope that my slides can be a useful reference for future coding. I took things from the man page and put them in table formats so that maybe it's more clear. Uh, what each of these things means, and uh, uh, if you don't think that's true, then, oh well, sorry, you wasted some time. <laughs> nice. So, my name is Doch, James Stanley, I am a systems das ist schon engineer, hilfreich. meaning that I do DevOps stuff, meaning that I uh, use Bash all the time, uh, on my stuff, on other people's stuff, on my company's stuff. Uh, I work in web hosting, so uh, I'm always touching lots and lots of machines that are then running lots of virtual machines. Uh, and containers and so forth. Uh, so, uh, this stuff is nice here. Yeah. Uh, there's the, the slide link, and that'll be up as long as I can keep it up. So, some notes about this. Uh, I assume you're familiar with basic command line concepts. You understand you put something in on the terminal, and uh, things happen, or they don't because you know. <coughs> uh, I'm going to be talking about Bash, not about all the cool things that you can do on the GNU Linux or other Unis. So I'm not going to be talking about LS and AUK. I will assume a GNU Linux machine because that's what you should be doing, and I'm a preacher. And I think yeah, that so Bash is flexible and nicht. fun, so for everybody who's one of those Bash haters, I think that you're wrong, and you're just not, you have, you have to readjust your attitude, I think, because, uh, you know, it lets you do a lot of cool things really quick. Yep. So the first thing that a lot of people fail to notice is that when you enter some command line, Uh, not everything's equal, right? So the command that you are running may be an actual file, like bin ls, right? That's just bash forking out to some other process on the system that's written, not in bash, that's doing its own thing, perfectly fine, right? But bash also has built-in commands where it doesn't have to run anything external. It's part of bash itself, and it has preserved syntactic words called keywords. Uh, you can define functions, and your distribution likely already has defined many of them for you. Uh, and then an alias is just a simple alias. And so here, this was uh, from Ubuntu some, I don't know how many years ago. Uh, but type dash A, 
and then followed by whatever command will tell you exactly what that's doing. Uh, it'll even unalienate wow. for you. Wow, right? 10 so out of 10 you already. You see, I, I type dash A and I put a few commands. Right, so LS is aliased. The LS color equals auto, so that gives you the colors when you're looking around your directories. But Bash is smart enough to know that, you know, obviously it doesn't just infinitely recurse on that LS alias. So you can see that it's actually glaub, been LS. Bitte sag mir, dass ich den Tag nicht schon kenne. Whereas CD is a shell built in, right? CD is just changing basically an internal shell variable. Ich will diesen Tag nicht schon kennen. So an external program here is that needs to be a built in. Uh, while it's a shell keyword, that's a shell, uh, syntactic environment where you can make a loop and do things based on certain conditions. And genpass, this was the genpass function that Ubuntu had defined that was automatically sourced in my shell with the default profile, right? And that's just a quick and dirty way to generate a pseudo-random password. <coughs> and we'll get into that now. All of those cool looking things work. If you want to get help with Bash in your OS, now that you know what types of commands that you're running, it's going to be a little bit easier. Uh, type will tell you what it is. Help will give you help nicht. with uh, Bash keywords and built-ins. Apropos uh, will try to help you find the right man page for a uh, file command. Uh, and man obviously brings up the man page. And then info is primarily for uh, new programs. Basically kind of like man, more complicated. Less people use it. It's good stuff. Uh, and then, uh, you know, just run these at your, at your own leisure. Um, I think it's worth looking at all of these. Man-A intro should give you an overview of your operating system. So it might be worth looking at. Uh, help help tells you how to use help, right? So man-man, same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, just some things a lot of people overlook, but, you know, it might actually tell you the one thing that kind of speeds up your daily workflow when you're trying to sort, sort through a problem. Uh, Google does not always give you the best answer. So, that being said, these are basically the definitions that the Bash man page uses, and I'll try to stick more or less to them as we go through the talk. Uh, that will make it easier for you to look things up later. So, a word is a sequence of characters uh, considered to be a single unit. Uh, list is one or more commands or pipelines. Right? So, ls is a list, and ls, pipe, grep, pipe, whatever, right? that's also in a list. Uh, a name is a special type of word. It only has alphanumeric characters and underscores and cannot begin with an, uh, a numeric character. And then a parameter is basically a variable, uh, but parameter is a more general term that we'll use here uh, because uh, some parameters are not variable, like special parameters and positional parameters uh, and so forth. So anytime you run a command, going to be able to determine whether that command succeeded or failed, uh, unless the person who wrote that command is being uncooperative and don't give you any indication of that. Or if it doesn't matter sometimes, right? So a uh, successful command will return a status of zero, and any other status that's returned is unsuccessful. So the other valid things you can return are 1 through 255. It cannot be negative. Uh, and that basically allows you to signal to the end user or to the script that's running it a certain type of error, right, using a different return code. So that way you can have scripts that are sensitive to why your rsync failed, and maybe they can automatically do something to fix this, right? You can react to things in a smart way instead of just saying, well, the whole thing failed, now it's up to the user to figure it out. So if the programs that you're interacting with give good return codes, it's very useful when you're trying to script things and automate around certain types of failure cases, or at least to be able to provide the user some sort of diagnosis to help them uh, as they're trying to track down where their bugs coming from, why they're having problems. So to see that real quick, uh, true just returns true, right? And the dollar uh, sign in bash obviously introduces an expansion, a parameter expansion. The question mark is a special parameter which encapsulates the return value of the command that was just ex executed before that. So when we run true, it returns success, and then we echo that return value because it was uh, it exited immediately before that, and that's zero, which means success. Now, throughout this talk, uh, it's going to be important to look here too. That is in the prompt they have encoded that return value. So for some of these examples, I won't always just be echoing it, uh, and it'll be there. Now, the tricky thing here is you might be thinking that <coughs> zero means that the true was successful. In this case, that zero means that the echo was successful because the echo was the last command that my prompt saw. Make sense? And you can see that here. False. And 
then we echo the return value, one. False, failed. Obviously, that's what we want it to do. But my prompt says zero. Not because the false succeeded, but because an echo, it's really hard for an echo to fail. I don't know if I've ever done it. <laughs> so, um, you know, anytime you echo something, don't try to check the return value after that because you can, you know, it's a preview. So list operators, uh, these are all the ways that we can combine commands into larger lists. Um, obviously a list has a list inside, has a list inside, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, everything's a list, right? Uh, so uh, obviously a new line is one way to separate things. It's hard to call them a list when uh, you're running them separately. Most people wouldn't, I wouldn't. Um, but if you want to put two things that you're going to run separately in sequence anyway together on one line, you separate them with a semicolon. The first one happens first, the second one happens second. Uh, and it's uh, literally the same as pressing enter twice. So uh, if that key gets worn out, this will help. If we want things to happen asynchronously, uh, that is to say simultaneously, or without regard to the ordering of events, we can use a single ampersand. And that will execute the thing that precedes it in the background. Right? So we can put an ampersand after every list and execute them all in the background. In this example, list zero and list one. List zero goes in the background and list <coughs> one comes in the foreground. Whatever happens to list zero, that's gonna do whatever it's gonna do and we don't care about it, we can go look at it later. There's job control and bash, you can go investigate it, you know, obviously once list one is no longer in the foreground. Uh, double ampersand uh, basically sets up a conditional where list one only executes if list, list zero uh, was successful and double pipe is the opposite. It only executes list one if list zero uh, was a complete failure. Oh, deswegen gehen die kaputt. Now I get it. Um, play the convoluted example there just to get something that takes slightly longer than an echo. Right? And so this ampersand <coughs> means that everything before it is going to run uh, in the background and then the echo hello after it is going to run in the foreground and then I'm separating it and I'm saying after all of that I just want to wait. So this just is telling my shell instead of when the echo exits to drop me back to my shell and then uh, you know throw output at me whenever. I want to wait for all of the things that I've asked you to do to complete including the background task. So we get more output here than we asked for. The first line is Bash telling me, uh, hey, I put one job in the background, and then here's its PID, its process ID. The second line is the output from my echo hello, because that's really quick. The third line is the output from head-c5000 dev random. So I'm just pulling the first 5,000 characters off of the pseudo random device that's available uh, in Linux. And then the fourth line with the one again, is telling me that my background task, job one, has completed. Now if I do that uh, with out the way, you see I'm dropped back on my prompt here, and then I just get a bunch of extra text after the prompt that looks weird. It's not actually something I typed. When I press enter, it doesn't do something, except that now that the shell has refreshed, it tells me that that first job exited. So that's why the weight kind of made that nicer, but it's completely unnecessary. Yes, we can find out really easily. Wait, is the shell built in? So how would I get help on that, right? Help, wait. And then it'll tell you what you need to know about it. And if you need more, then I guess probably just fire up the Bash man page and try searching for wait and see uh, all the unrelated uses of the word wait in that man page. <laughs> So then, uh, going back to true, if we want to talk about tautologies for a second. And same thing for false, right? So uh, these things work very predictably. Get them both on the same screen there. Um, so this is basically how you can take lists, put them together, you can make one dependent conditionally upon the other, or throw them in the background you want to run a bunch of things at once, or you don't care when they finish, or you don't need them to be on the taking up your uh, terminal input, and so forth. So if you want to do a slightly more complex branching, uh, you're going to use an if statement. These 
mimic English pretty closely, and I think almost everybody in this room has probably seen one before, so I won't spend too much time, but if list zero is successful, then execute list one. If list zero is successful, then execute list one. Else, as in otherwise, execute list two, right? So in the first box, if, it, if list zero is unsuccessful, that ran. So if list zero was something that said like, you know, rm-rf root, you already nuked your whole computer at that point. Whether it was successful or not probably doesn't matter, but if it was successful, hopefully there's still enough left in RAM to uh, give you that list one and do something. Uh, the second one, right, uh, if list zero, so then if that fails, then you, you're not going to get list one to run, and you're going to get list two instead. But in the first case, nothing happens if it was there, right? And so, and so on and so forth with uh, the nested ones, uh, it's pretty straightforward. <coughs> but for good measure. I'm just going to run any any command there. You know, there's tests and stuff we'll see, but it can be any command because everything ultimately has an exit status. Hopefully they're being cooperative and it's meaningful. So I'm just going to look at Etsy OS to release and see if I'm actually on Gen 2, which I'm very happy to say this year I am. It had been Arch Linux on the other laptop that I had for a while. And well, if you like Arch over Gen 2, then we disagree. So, uh, tests are very useful, especially with uh, conditional things like if, but you can also just use those uh, as a list itself. So when you run a test, it returns a value, so you can put double ampersand or double pipe after it to branch directly. Um, there's two ways to do it. Uh, both actually are in POSIX. Sometimes people talk about the single bracket being the POSIX way, but both are in POSIX. The, the difference, the way that, the reason that people, I think, use the single bracket for portability sometimes is because there's also the file version of it, which is uh, the weirdest, you know, command I think on the system, just to have it be a bracket. Um, but so if you're running in a uh, POSIX -E shell, but for some reason don't have access to the test command, uh, I don't know how that happens. But anyway, they do have the, the actual uh, files that can do the same thing for you uh, to run that as a system process. So that's the the difference. The reason that's the only reason you want to want to use that probably is if you ever for some reason. I would say in general use the double bracket because it, you can do a lot more interesting things in there. Um, and so the double bracket is a keyword. Uh, and that means that Bash is able to parse your string differently and uh, set up a different syntactic environment. So it, Bash is able to do more things here, right? So uh, word splitting is not performed during any parameter expansion there. Word splitting means uh, Bash will by default split things on white space. So unless you quote word one and word two, that's going to be uh, Five words, um, or one word if quoted, right? Uh, the right-hand side of a string comparison when you're in here, and we'll see the different tests soon, uh, is uh, treated as a pattern when it's not quoted and a string when quoted, and we'll see that soon. And you can also do regular expressions. We don't really go over them here, uh, but regular expressions are fantastic. Bash supports them and uh, pulls out things in groups and everything, all the neat things that you'd expect to be able to do with regular expressions. No, you do not need to fire up Perl or off or set uh, to do a lot of those things unless you have to process lots of lines of text and you want the efficiency of those programs and by all means. But you don't need to fire up external processes willy-nilly just to do one little thing and pull out a line from a string. Um, and then uh, short-circuiting logical operators, uh, much like the ones that operate on lists, uh, are available inside here, so you can combine tests with one within one bracket of ex uh, uh, expression. So here are those conditional expressions, the com some of the common ones. Uh, if you do help test, you'll see all of them, uh, and then that might confuse you sometimes. So then you know, look on the internet or just play around with them. So we can look to see if a file exists, if it's a regular file, if it's a directory, if the file descriptor is open and refers to a terminal. So that's a, that's a way to determine whether you're talking to a person or a script, right? Um, you can say, is, is this file newer than that one? Is it a hard link to the other one? Is this string empty? Is this string not empty? Uh, are these strings the same or are they not the same? Does it match a pattern? Does it match a regex? Now notice the, the crucial difference there is that the right side is quoted when we're matching it literally as a pattern. When you don't quote that right side, uh, sorry, when we're matching it literally not as a pattern. When you don't quote that right side, it becomes a pattern. And that's the same as file blobbing. That's not a regex unless you use the tilde version. So here we're going to see if the string much content has any content. How do we know that it did? Because my prompt snitched on it. It told us it was successful, right? 
and say, uh, is the string while empty? It's not, right? My prompt told us one, one's failure. We got something back that was not zero, right? So we could branch on that. We can, that, that could have been a variable in there instead of uh, a string that's, you know, it's kind of obvious to us, right? If you know what that Z means. Um, but this way we can branch on things. We can use variables there and uh, determine if the user actually gave us the input that they promised. Uh, so we can run a few of them in, in succession. I, I want to know about Etsy, right? Like, is it a, does it exist? Is it a file? Is it a directory? So that all runs, and we only see exists in directory. So the one that said and and echo, re echo regular file, well, I guess dash f Etsy must have failed, right? Because it's not a regular file. It's a directory. And here, uh, dash t zero. Do you remember dash t was to tell us uh, if it was uh, basically if it's connected to a terminal, zero is standard in, right? So zero is our file descriptor. You can use any file descriptor there, and bash you can rearrange file descriptors in all sorts of wacky ways, so that could be important at some point. <coughs> and uh, if we want to show uh, that I'm not a person, we just replace zero, right? So we're still looking at standard in, but now standard in is not coming from my keyboard anymore. It's coming from a file, so that's false. The, the script is no longer being fed input from a, uh, from potentially a live human being, right? I could fake that too, but... Um, so when you're writing a script, then you need to know, like, do I turn on the interactive? Do I give them the menu? Or do I just make this default if they don't tell me? This is how you kind of branch on that. So we're going to make some files, wait, and then we're going to see if file zero is newer than file one, and it's not, right? Because I wrote file zero first. I waited three seconds, and then I wrote file one. So of course it's not, right? But this way we can do simple tests like that. And uh, we can check if, the, if those files are hard links. Why would they be, right? So first we got one, it failed. This one failed here, right? So they're not hard links, but then I made them hard links. You can see that here. And uh, then it succeeded. We can throw this as our test case for the if conditional. So does ABC equal ABC? Yep. On the other hand, does ABC equal C? Nope. Straightforward. Right. So, pattern matching. All the beautiful stuff that can happen on the right-hand side when you don't quote it. Uh, you've seen this probably, ls star, ls star dot text, uh, whatever, you know. Uh, it's the same thing uh, that, that it uses for path name expansion. Uh, you can use this in pattern matching, which occurs with the case keyword that we'll see soon, or the double bracket, or uh, parameter expansion, and we'll get to that. Uh, so star matches any string including null. Question mark does not match null. It has to match any single character. And then within single brackets is a character class, or double brackets with the uh, colon, there are some named classes that kind of make it easier. Instead of going A dash Z to go A through Z, you can just say lower, right, or alpha for everything including uppercase and, and so forth. The, the names are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and if you want to negate a character class, that is to say, I want everything that is not A through F, right, uh, just put a caret in the beginning of that. So here, we don't quote the right-hand side. Does ABC equals star C? Does it, does ABC, is ABC a string that, that ends in C, basically, is what this is saying. I guess. Or that has any number of things followed by a C. More technical. Um, so, yeah, it is. Linux Fest Northwest 2017. Does that match A through Z followed by anything followed by not a digit? It does not. Uh, fuck. Does it match A through Z followed by anything followed by a digit? It does. And we can put stars on the outside. It doesn't change anything. Because the pattern matching is not exhaustive. So this doesn't need to be like match from the first character to the last character. And it's not regex either. So there's not a way to say this many of this without just repeating yourself, right? It's simple pattern matching. It's blobbing. Uh, you can throw those stars on there if it makes it more readable, but it doesn't actually change what it's looking for here. 
change the input, uh, we can see that we can still do the pattern matching. Very close example. And then that one will fail because there's no A through Z. However, if we negate the match, we can do some interesting things, right? We can say, does this not match something that doesn't have a digit? No, right, because it does have a digit. But this is uh, the way that you would say, I want a string that has no digits with a basic pattern match without using regex, right? You need to do basically a double negative to prove the existence, to prove the non-existence, right, of digits in that string with pattern match. Straightforward, uh, same thing from the shell, but uh, you, uh, from uh, you know using files, you probably don't get as tricky with file globbing. But when you're looking at strings real quick, yeah, and it uh, gets up and we need to speed up the development process. So uh, case is a great way to use them. Case word in pattern zero, pattern one, and so forth. So we're going to use word will be basically like the left hand side that we were just looking at, and then pattern zero will be the right hand side of the pattern. Uh, and so forth with pattern one. So this is a way to take one string and compare it against successive patterns and run some code uh, once you find one that matches. All right. so if, if word matches pattern zero, we're gonna run list, z list zero and then exit. If word matches pattern one or pattern two, we're gonna run list one and exit. And if nothing else happens, then nothing else happens. So case one, that's the string O N E, right? Uh, is it O? Is it O followed by something followed by E? Is it O followed by any number of things, or is it just any number of things? It's O followed by E. Uh, o followed by uh, something followed by E. Right. So it's not O because this is uh, that would be a literal O. You need to tell it that there's something more, right? Um, so then it falls down and it checks the next one. That one matches because the question mark can be substituted with the end. And so it prints what I told it to print, and it exits. It doesn't check farther. It would match O star, but it doesn't get far enough. There is a way to tell it to cascade, but we won't go into that uh, here. So here are some parameters. We have the positional parameters, the special parameters, and then user-defined variables. Uh, positional parameters, when you run a program, you give it arguments, they get filled from left to right positionally. And that's using word splitting. So if you quote your first argument that has a few words, then that all gets thrown into dollar one. Otherwise, it's dollar one, dollar two, dollar three, and so forth. Uh, you have to put them in the braces, the curly braces, uh, once you get above nine, uh, to let it know that this is still the variable name and not expand variable one and then put a zero after it. Um, special parameters, we won't go into all of them. We'll kind of keep them around. Uh, but uh, you'll, you'll, they can tell you things about the number of positional uh, parameters or give you all of them, give you all of them uh, with uh, word boundaries protected. Um, you know, and we saw a dollar question already uh, as the uh, error code uh, and so forth. Uh, and then to define mm -hmm. a variable, I didn't name, hear see it. remember name is a special type of word, does not begin with a number and only has, it's only alphanumeric. Um, and underscores, and then uh, equals, and then whatever you're assigning to that, that name. Uh, usually a string, but we could also use this to make arrays, we'll see later. Uh, crucially, no spaces around that equal sign. It's not like other languages where that equal can be five miles away. Um, Bash will only look at it as an assignment if it's name equals string immediately. If you have spaces there, it's just gonna think these are random arguments or a command name that happens to have an equal sign. <coughs> So when we expand okay. things, there's the simple way where you just say dollar variable and it just prints whatever's in the variable. Uh, and then there's the, uh, the interesting way where we can expand it in interesting ways to get different results and uh, do tests or substitutions or uh, excise parts of the string. Uh, lots, of, lots of nice things. So this is one of those tables I was telling you about. So param is the name of our variable. And um, 
the curly braces can always be used in an, in an, in an expansion, but if we use some certain uh, special keywords here that are in orange in the middle of that expansion, they tell Bash to uh, do certain things, right? So if param was unset, that's the first column, this is what you get when you echo this thing. If param was set to an empty string, it's the second column, and if param was set to an actual string like dmu, that's the third column. So this way you can kind of get an idea when you look at these, once you've used them a little bit, this is one of those tables you can look at to say, uh, which one of these do I need for this case that I'm trying to test for this thing, right? So uh, the minus will return a default value. So uh, let's say you're taking user input into this variable and they don't provide any, or you're looking for a file and it wasn't there and it ended up empty, whatever, right? So this way you can say, uh, what directory do you want me to save this in? They don't put anything, you can just do dash and then put, you know, uh, dollar home or something, right? Use their home directory as a default because you assume that's somewhere that they can write to, or a temp directory or something. Uh, if you want to actually assign that back to param instead of just using it in the expansion, that dash becomes an equals. Otherwise, when, you, when you're expanding this with a default, it's only affecting the way that that variable is interpolated at the time that it runs. It's not reassigning that variable without that equals. Uh, plus will give you an alternate value. So if I do have a value in this variable, I'm going to print this other thing instead. And then a question mark will error if there's nothing there. So you can put a custom error string in here if you want to, um, to basically say, uh, just use this variable in this command, and if that variable is for some reason unset, abort immediately, don't actually run the command, drop an error, the custom one if you want. Um, but that way you don't have to set up an extra explicit check before running that command. You can just put it in the line and do it the quick and dirty way. And so it's all the same beneath there, except that we treat empty as unset. So that uh, affects, obviously, the, the alternate uh, value on the, in the empty case. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, let's, let's look at some examples of these. So we're going to set some positional parameters here. Set, dash, dash, everything that comes after dash, dash is, is <coughs> as if we had run a program with positional parameters, but it's just in my shell still. So this will just kind of show us. Um, some of the special parameters that, uh, that we can pull out of the string, uh, sorry, out of um, the, the environment when a command is executed with positional parameters. That's a set. Uh, let's, let's look at some examples of these. So we're going to set some positional parameters here. Set, dash, dash, everything that comes after dash, dash is, is as if we had run a program with positional parameters, but it's just in my shell still. So this will just kind of show us um, Okay. Some of the special parameters that, uh, that we can pull out of the string, uh, sorry, out of um, the, the environment when a command is executed with positional parameters. Oh, so, this is interesting. Dollar one is one, dollar two is two, dollar three is three, four because they were quoted, so they weren't split, and dollar four is five. So we have four parameters. Dollar five is empty because there was none. Um, so dollar bang tells us how many arguments there were for uh, dollar star just gives them all to us as a string and dollar ampersand gives them all to us but split by words. So here I, I'm printing it uh, per line. So one, two, three, four together again. Right. So these are some of their special parameters interacting with the positional parameters. Which? Yes. Yes. Dollar at is effectively an array and it maintains the word splitting, whereas dollar star just kind of puts it all as one big string if it's not important. So here we can run something and we can save that error and then look at it later, right? And return that, you know, we can still run the rest of our function or do whatever else needs to happen and retain that error. Uh, but that's one of those things you gotta remember to do if you wanna use that error code later because it won't stick around after you run another command. So when we're expanding these things, let's have a param that uh, is set to an actual string, and it's going to return the actual string, right? I gave a default value for expansion, but we didn't use it, right? Because it actually did have content. That's a risk to serve. On the other hand, if we unset it, well, this is and then echo it, we're going to get the default value. Uh, that makes the sense. Kiss, uh, so this is where you can... Uh, Easily use user defaults is one thing that I really miss in a lot of other languages. You have to do kind of janky stuff. Mm -hmm. It's really nice to just build it right into the variable expansion. We 
can use a nifty custom error string. Right, so here we see the one in my prompt, the command failed, it's an echo, which I said never fails, right? Why did it fail? Because I told Bash, when you're expanding this parameter to feed into the echo command, if there's nothing there, let's just fail out with this error, right? So this could be that RM, you know, if they didn't put slash, oh, then Leute, not do anything, what the fuck? they don't want to destroy it. Ich werde hier sterben, oder? And we can look for a path and uh, make sure that they have one. Right, so this is where you can use the alternate value um, uh, and be sensitive to things. And uh, uh, one of the ways that people use this a lot is um, they'll just use a, oh my a plus and then some string that they're looking for, and then compare that to something to see if they got the thing that they're looking for. People do kind of weird things like that, but basically with the plus, <laughs> you use the alternate. So it's a way you can check and make sure that something set that actually using it or, uh, still use the thing that you need and kind of put that into the, the command to make sure. Uh, Ja, dass ich den Helm nicht brauche. Lol. So Bräuchte mal einen mit Aqua Affinity. Das hat mich jetzt echt erschrocken mit diesem Saug. Das kannte ich nicht. Ja, and die Fishing so God war jetzt eh nicht so selten, oder? Aber jetzt habe ich ein bisschen was vom Video vor lauter Schreck verpasst. We can use a nifty custom error string, right? So here we see the one in my prompt, the command failed. It's an echo, which I said never fails, right? Why did it fail? Because I told Bash, when you're expanding this parameter to feed into the echo command, if there's nothing there, let's just fail out with this error, right? So this could be that RM, you know, if they didn't put slash, then we're just not going to do anything and assume they don't want to destroy it. And we can look for a path and uh, make sure that they have one, right? So this is where you can use the alternate value uh, and be sensitive to things. And uh, uh, one of the ways that people use this a lot is um, they'll just use a uh, you know, plus and then some string that they're looking for and then compare that to something to see if they got the thing that they're looking for. People do kind of weird things like that. But basically, with the plus, you use an alternate. So it's a way you can check to make sure that something's set without actually using it or uh, still use the thing that you need and kind of put that into the, the command to make sure uh, that the other thing that they're going to need later is, is still set, or was set at all. And so we can do other neat things taking substrings, so you don't have to print the entire variable, right? You can only, you can just use the part that's useful to you in that, in that moment. And this kind of allows you to put things together too. You can kind of make your own little data structures. You can say, well, the, you know, these strings are each going to have a colon in the middle, and the first thing is going to be uh, the file path, and the second thing is going to be the command or something, right? You can do whatever you want there and just kind of use this as a quick way to take either side of that character that you know doesn't appear in there again or something, right? Uh, so you can use this to kind of build machinery like that. Uh, extraction's pretty straightforward. You're just going to take an all offset. So if our param is mandrake, uh, offset of three, length of two, we get drake. Um, uh, sorry, offset of three, no length, we get Drake, so it goes in three and then takes the rest of the word. Length of two, we only get the DR. Uh, if we're going to remove from the left edge, and I, I like to think of these left edge, right edge, uh, pound comes at the beginning of the comment, percent comes at the end of the number, and so they just come in from that edge, right? So, uh, param and then pound pattern, so our pattern is star A, same pattern as globbing, same pattern as the test we just saw. We're going to take everything up to the first A, right? So it's just going to be N Drake. If we double up the pound sign, it makes it read. So it's going to match from the left side of the word all the way across as far as it can find until it finds the last A from the left. And it's just going to leave us with KE. So percent does the same thing from the other side. Obviously, I uh, put the uh, asterisk on the other side of the A since we're coming in from the right. So we're going to match up to the first A coming from the right, and that gives us Mander. And if we are get greedy, we go all the way across and we select an M. There is no way to say, I want to take two in. You would just have to iterate or something. It's either the first or all the way across. But you can just keep reassigning and taking off the parts that you want if you want to do it that way instead of, you know, piping the value into said and doing a regex there or something. Or you can use a regex in the shell. Um, but this is, you know, the quick way to do some things that uh, you just need to expand at once. You don't need to worry about saving everything, right? So um, with bash version, that's something that's just set in your shell anyway. Uh, we can just take the first character off of that, 
important to know that we're using Bash 4 and not Bash 3. If you're on OS X for some reason, uh, you'll notice that it's Bash 3 because they don't care about you. <coughs> oh, it's C-Shell nowadays. <laughs> uh, so if we want to take that path and greedily remove everything from the left-hand side up to the last colon, that'll leave me with the least significant part of my path. The part that has the binaries that I care so little about that if something's named the same as them beforehand in my path, it gets executed instead. So the thing that I care least about is core curl, I guess. Um, so with these, obviously, it's very powerful. And uh, you know, if I wanted to do this and make it not greedy, I just lop off the first thing. I lop off the thing that I care the most about, right? Or I can come in from the other way. If I turn the star around and then turn that into a percent, right? And now I've lopped off the thing that I don't care about because what was I going to run from there anyway, honestly? <laughs> We can also substitute things when we expand the value. So our param is Ubuntu. Uh, pattern can be uh, u question mark, so u followed by something. And our string is just x. In this case, uh -huh. we're going to re replace the pattern with the string. So a single slash replaces once. And a double slash gets read. And uh, we can also ground it to the left or right edge. So we can do a replacement. Um, and there's not, a greedy or, there's not a greedy version of this. But you can do a replacement that's anchored to one edge or the other uh, by putting the pound and the percent after. And the same mnemonics kind of apply with numbers and comments. So to see these, we're going to take my path again and um, I'm going to use dash E to uh, let Echo know that it can go ahead and give me new lines when it sees a backslash N. Dash E. And so now I can actually read the path, right? Because when it's a <coughs> long colon separated value, your eyes aren't very good at parsing that. Oui. So we're going to replace those colons with new lines, and suddenly it's very clear what's in my path. So uh, just quick and dirty way again with variables that are already set. We don't need to change the variable. We don't need to pass it to a bunch of programs. We don't need a loop. We can just quickly display something to the user that we're storing uh, in a different way uh, and just manipulate it upon expansion. So it's very powerful. We can do indirection. We can list things, and uh, we can give lengths of things, right? So uh, the, the box has some givens for these examples to get those results, basically. Um, so indirect expansion, uh, you won't use that often, probably. But uh, it's basically kind of like a pointer, right? So if uh, name 0, hey, doch, the value of name 0 is name 1, and name 1 is also a variable whose value is below, when I expand bang name zero, it gives me hello. It gives me the variable, uh, sorry, the value of the variable that name zero points to. Ich habe das locker schon so in dieser Serie gesehen, in dieser Dauerwerbesendung. You can and get really complicated and confuse everybody who has to maintain your script. Um, when you have a bunch of uh, variables set, one nice thing is putting a prefix on them. Right, you can say, you know, my script is called uh, Jim, right? So I can say, I'm just going to say underscore Jim begins all of my variable names, right? And so then I can go bang underscore Jim star, and that'll list every variable that begins with that. And then I can loop over those variables and do whatever I want. And uh, the same thing basically works in an array. Uh, it'll, it'll tell you, um, well, we'll see that later. Don't worry about that. Um, it'll tell you all the, the, the indexes, basically, but we'll, we'll get to those examples. And then uh, uh, the same thing, uh, we can see the length. Uh, if it's a string, it'll give you the number yeah, of characters. If you're looking at a variable cute. that's an array, it'll give you the number of elements. So uh, yeah, things are wrapping around a little with this resolution, but hopefully it's uh, not too discongruent there. We're going to set a parameter, uh, and we're going to give the value of path. Hint, there's going to be some indirection. And then we're going to print things with a couple new lines after each value that, that I'm printing. Um, let's just see what we get. Right, so dollar param is path, and an indirect expansion of dollar param gives us the value of dollar path expanded. And then if we want to actually go ahead and operate on the value that we're expanding from the indirect expansion, we can still do that and take the most important thing from my path by excising all of the 
the, the text from the right-hand side in greedily until we find a colon. Does that make sense? It's kind of a convoluted example. You might not use something like that very much. But some of these things can be combined. Uh, you can't get too creative. That will tell you, obviously, that it failed when it failed. Um, there is a lot of ways that you can't combine these things, but that's one of the ways that you can. I don't know that I would recommend that you do. Uh, these are all variables. Uh, right now, I didn't make any of them. They, they were there when that started. Uh, that begin with capital B A S H, right? So uh, Bash has lots of information about itself. You can refer to these variables in your script to learn things about your user's environment and so forth. And my path is 100 field characters long. Any questions about parameter expansion in general? Yeah, I do it, it is. Sure. Okay. All right, so arrays. Uh, Hooray. More complex stri data structure than a string, obviously. Uh, same kind of assignment. Don't put any spaces around the equals. Uh, but we're going to use parens. And uh, it'll do word splitting inside, right? So. Quoting applies the same way. So that's going to be a uh, four element array, that first line. And you can add to it with a plus equals, which you can also do with strings, by the way. Uh, and that will just append to a string. And uh, it, with an array, it will append to the, the latest, uh, well, it'll create an index, a new index at the latest index, basically. And uh, you can also um, use the plus equals uh, notation to modify an element that's in there. Right, so with array <coughs> equals uh, zero, one, two, three, and more, uh, zero is going to be our zero element, right? We start counting at zero in Unix. Um, so here I'm actually going to add one and I'm going to reassign zero to be capital Z-E-R-O instead of lowercase Z-E-R-O. And you can do those both at the same time. Um, so it's a nice way to, uh, to modify things. Uh, we can recreate it as a different version of itself, right? So um, these are similar to the things that we saw with string expansions, right? But we're modifying the elements Lol. of the array as they are expanded. We're not reassigning them unless we were explicitly reassigning them as I am here. So the part uh, inside the parentheses here, we could also just print that uh, instead of reassigning it to itself. But, but if we took an input and we're just, you know, we're the type of people who hate spaces in uh, our file systems and we're creating files, we can do something like this to take that array of files that we're going to create and just replace ah, all yeah, the spaces so and all those names with so, so much minus, okay. Personally, I have nothing against <coughs> spaces and file names. It's 2017. Uh, we can also just take elements. So this isn't going to apply to the values of each of those elements, right? This is going to take uh, elements uh, two uh, through four out of the array. It's not going to take characters two through four out of each element. Right, so we're operating on the elements of the array here, not the characters and the strings that may be the elements of the array. And uh, to you know, retrieve a certain element, uh, pretty common array syntax there, just put the, the index inside the brackets, inside the expansion. And here you definitely need the braces on these expansions for, um, for any of the, the special uh, modifiers that we're putting in there. And the, uh, the bang will show the indices. So show some of these in action, right? So we're going to set that array, and then we're going to print each one by line. Right? And notice I'm using the, uh, we could expand the whole array. Um, you can do it like that too, right? But that loses all your, your splitting. Uh, it loses the fact that three and more is one element and not three. Um, and there I was just printing it by line. So uh, we can add something to it, right? And now when we print it, we see that extra element added. It's on its own line because it's one element still because it was quoted. Uh, we can go ahead and print it with, uh, you know, underscores instead of spaces. Or we can just take a slice of it. Or we can go ahead and list the, the indices. So maybe we'll, we want to loop over these individually for some reason, right? So we can say, you know, we'll get the for loops, but, you know, for index in bang array at, right, we can get all the indexes and loop over them manually. You can do a lot of math in the shell, but you cannot do floating point. Although there is a guy who did write a 
functions in Bash to emulate floating point. Ja, hä? Okay, ich habe denselben Talk schon mal gesehen. Egal, den kann man sich öfters gönnen. das einmal schaffen bitte das gibt's ja nicht Ob das Uh, 
Uh, you can also use letters and ranges. There's much less uh, reason to, but there's a good one. And uh, one of the most useful things, I don't have a lot of useful examples in here, and somebody called me out once and said, you know, especially with race expansion, you know, you're telling us how to make words like new or Amy or something. Uh, so here's where I actually use this all the time, right? You, you just want to make a quick backup of something or rename something. And instead of typing the whole thing out twice, you can just throw a little brace expansion on the end, right? And then I made a test file, and then I copied it to test file dot back. Or I could have moved it, renamed it, whatever, right? Um, so that that's one of the more useful things that you'll get out of this call. Sorry? Yes. Yes, so das actually, Beispiel uh, habe ich nicht gesehen. Das habe ich mir beim letzten Mal gedacht, wofür man das brauchen uh, kann. Das ist nicht. Das ist nice. Um, yeah, so basically what happens when it expands that race expansion, it makes test file space test file that back. Right? And that's just because the left hand side of the common, that expansion was empty. So the first expansion, uh, it just gives us the same prefix that we put before it with nothing changed. And then in the second expansion, it adds the dot back. Uh, we can run commands this way. I told you to run man man to learn how to man. Mm -hmm. And there it is. You don't even need to type it twice. Completely useless. Compound commands. Uh, we can iterate. We can do conditionals and we can do command groups. So iteration, uh, we're going to do in loops. Uh, we're going to loop over lists of commands. You remember them from earlier. Uh, those are going to be inside do and done. That tells the, the loop when to start and when to not be started anymore. And uh, while, until, for, and select are the loops that we're going to talk about in bash. Uh, conditionals, same thing, execute lists uh, if they meet certain conditions. And we already saw that with if and case. But those are compound commands, which is important for the definition of function later. And command groups are grouped lists of commands sharing any external redirections whose return value is that of the list. So when you group these commands uh, and uh, the whole thing exits back to your primary shell, the return value is that of basically the last thing in the list, whatever the list returned as a whole. Um, but if you do redirections around that whole list structure, uh, they apply to everything inside of it. So it's a, a nice way to group a whole bunch of commands together and take all of the standard error and throw it in one file instead of having to repeat yourself both times. So, while and until loops, we're going to, while list zero is true, do list one. All right, so execute list zero. If it returns success, we execute list one, and then we circle around again. Unless list one broke the loop, we're going to execute list zero again and see if that still returns success. So once it returns fail, we're done, and we move on to the next thing after the loop. Until does the uh, exact opposite thing. Until list zero returns success, we do list one. So list zero fails, we say, great, I'm going to run list one. If list zero fails, great, I'm going to run list one. If list zero succeeds, oh, our work here is done. And uh, while read uh, is an incredibly handy um, uh, construct for uh, parsing lines of text uh, in Bash. And instead of piping them to an external program or something, you can just take each line in, uh, read sets a variable. We'll see some of that later. Quick example of a for loop with read. We'll see some of that now, I guess. Uh, while read variable one, variable two, we're just going to echo them in the reverse order, variable two, variable one. So I press enter, nothing happens. Why? Because I didn't tell it where to read from, so it's assuming that I meant to type something in here. So I'm going to say one, two, it's going to say two, one. That's pretty good. What if I say one, two, three? It's going to say two, three, one. Why? Because with read, uh, the last variable name that you give it grabs everything on the rest of the line if, if it gets more than you were expecting. So if you only want the first two things and you don't want if the, you know, the user might just keep typing or something, go ahead and throw an extra junk variable in the end to catch anything else, otherwise you're going to get weird things. Even if you don't care about it, it doesn't matter, go away later, right? Uh, until, it does the opposite, but let's say we have a count variable zero and we're going to uh, increment that count and until it's uh, greater than three, we're going to echo it. Right, so one, two, three, and then it was four, and we no longer echoed it. Right, so if we look at it now, it's four. 
crucially because we incremented it before expansion. And we can go ahead and uh, pipe things into while read, right? So here we're saying let's get a list of files from ls. Why not? And then we're going to do some fancy business on them, get some stuff from stat, get some stuff from mz5 some. Okay, and here I'm going to, uh, it basically gives me the list that I asked for. Um, you know, I'm printing each of these manually, so you can kind of uh, very quickly put together uh, your own, instead of using ls and trying to dig through that man page and maybe it doesn't have what you need, you only need certain columns, certain information, you have programs on your system that'll get it, now you can put them all together easily uh, based on what's going on in uh, a directory or, you know, you can pipe anything into this, right? With for loops and select loops, it's a little bit different. So. Um, one thing I'd like to put out, while and until loops typically iterate based on an external resource, and for and select loops iterate based on command line arguments. What I mean is when we just saw the while loop, one of the things we were doing is while read, right? So any number of lines I could sit here typing for days, weeks, months, years, and it'll keep reading it, right? It doesn't know when the end will be until I press control D and kill it. Uh, with a for select loop, it's it's mm. different because it's for name and words. Words is right there in the command line. They have to expand at the time that that, uh, that for loop is run. So that's not just going to sit there listening indefinitely to something because the command line can only be so long. I mean, there's going to be a limit on your system. It's pretty high. Depends on how your stuff's compiled and what things are set. But at a certain point, your command line can't get any larger and that's just um, so here, you know, there's, there's, once it starts running, you already have the whole list of everything that it's going to run on. That's the difference. So for name and words, so name is the name of a variable that gets inso assigned inside the loop based on each word that gets parsed out of words for each iteration. Oh, yeah. And then we're going to run list. And list may or may not refer to the actual variable, but the, they are inside the loop of the one with our name. And just repeat until all words have been exhausted. Uh, then we have the C style for loop with an initialization, a condition, and an afterthought. So uh, it's in an arithmetic expansion for a reason because it's a math thing, right? So we start with expression zero uh, that says maybe count equals zero or something. Expression one says, uh, you know, less than four. And uh, expression two is an afterthought. It happens after each iteration. So that might be, you know, uh, count plus plus, right? Uh. And then we do the list uh, as long as those conditions are all met each time. Select is the black sheep of the family here. Uh, it's not a loop in a normal sense. It sets up a little menu system for your user. So if you have a list of things and you want them to be able to press a button, uh, that's a really easy way to do it without writing machinery. Yourself. So for file and star, we're going to echo the stat, echo the MD5 sum commands that I put. And it's the same thing that we got before. So um, we can see those side by side, more or less. The, the whole echo command you know, doesn't fit on the screen. But uh, these do the same thing, right? One of them is using a while read loop, and the other one is using for file and star, right? So uh, the while read loop, in theory, ls-1 could be a command that just throws files at it indefinitely. You know, it may not just be looking at a directory and exiting. Maybe it's uh, waiting on, uh, it's tailing a file, and every time a new thing's written there, it writes the file in here, and we do something else, right? The for loop, obviously, is just going to operate on whatever we put there. It could be a star, it could be something else that expands the file names or whatever. Uh, but these can do the same things, you just might use them in different situations, right? So here we have for i and 1, 2, 3, 4, we're going to echo them all pretty low. Obviously, a useless example. Fill in your own useful code later. I don't know what you guys do. Uh, here's the C style for loop, right? So we have our uh, initialization, our condition in the middle, and our uh, afterthought, which increments it there. And then we're just going to echo it each time it goes through. So once i was no longer less than 5, that is to say it became 5 itself, uh, we exited the loop and stopped echoing whatever i was. Uh, similar thing here, just to show you what that actually is doing. If we want to write the C style for loop as a while loop, there it is. That's the same thing. So to put those side by side, um, we see we have the same initialization here as here. And then while colon just means while forever, I don't care, I'm going to break out of it some other way. 
and then we just do um, because we have this here, right? <coughs> we have our, our condition there built in, so that's why we don't put it in the while loop, and we can just break, and then that go to. So the same thing can be written different ways, right? And then select. So here's our one, two, three, four again, but we're going to call it choice instead because the user or the customer is who's important. So now I have a menu. What do I want? Well, I think I want two. Great, two is two. 43, well, that's nothing. Three, that's something, right? So uh, this is a loop because it'll keep doing that unless I tell it to break out in my code, which I don't. So uh, this is the rest of the talk. We're just going to do this. <laughs> Just kidding, control C throws a sig in, and then we see the return code of that thing failing because I killed it. Uh, so we can also go ahead and iterate over things that might be more useful, even though I keep promising to not be useful. This might be slightly useful to somebody, right? So now I have a list of all the files in this directory, and I can say, I want to know some statistics about file number 11. Great. I have uh, access to all of these things except birth. I don't know. Has anybody ever seen birth? I don't know where uh, How do you get birth? I don't know. Who gets it? Um, the file's going to, you know, everybody, all this can be changed anyway. You can't trust the file system. Uh, but yeah, so you can run any kind of arbitrary commands this way based off of a dynamically generated list of things, right? And provide a, uh, a menu to a user, which you might want to check for with uh, the test-g that we remember from before, because if a script is sitting there uh, looking at this menu, uh, well, I don't know what you expect to happen. Boy, he can set up. So command groups, uh, they treat a group as a single unit for redirection or branching. So we have the subshell, which is enclosed in parentheses, and the group command, which is enclosed in uh, the curly braces, uh, and obligatorily a space on the side of, inside of those braces, and a semicolon at the end of your command list. Why those kind of arbitrary seeming restrictions? Because otherwise Bash wouldn't know that he didn't need to do brace expansion. And we don't want Bash to just arbitrarily generate words when we want it to actually run commands and do interesting things for us. So uh, make sure you put those spaces and semicolon there when you're doing the uh, group command. So the difference between the subshell and the group command is that the subshell runs in its own distinct child shell, and the group command runs right here, right now in your current shell. Why is that important? Usually because of variables and stuff. So in a subshell, all variables are effectively local, locally scoped. Anything that happens in there dies in there, you know, other than writing files and doing permanent things. Um, when you're doing a group command, you can set all the variables you want, and they're still there when that group command exits, because that's your current shell that's still active, still in memory. So we're going to unset X, make sure that X isn't anything already. Inside a subshell, we're going to make x uh, uh, assign x to a value, and we're going to echo it. And then outside of the subshell, we're going to echo x. So inside the subshell, we get x is hello, and outside the subshell, x is still nothing. It's still unset from up here. If, however, we do that as a group command instead of in a subshell, x is still set outside of the group. And uh, uh, I guess the, the nice thing about this, other than scoping, um, right, like I said, the, the redirections apply to it and stuff. So if I do something like this, it applies to all the commands in there. Not that x equals hello puts output, but if we had a whole bunch of things that put output and we wanted to group them all together and say, I don't care about any of this output, that's a, the, the quick way to do it, right? Just pipe it all to dev null, basically, and forget about it. And you only have to write it once. And uh, obviously you can do much more complex things than that. Um, but that's the premise. So uh, if you're running Bash 4 or greater, uh, and not bogged down by the Steve Jobs OS legacy of the world, uh, you can use associative arrays. In Perl they're called hashes, and Python for some reason they're called dictionaries, even though dictionaries cannot have multiple values. But, um, this is the same thing basically in bash. Uh, so you have to use declare dash big A array to make it an associative array. Once it is, you can do these fun things with it. So instead of um, assigning by index number, although you could put a number there arbitrarily, uh, you can put any arbitrary thing in there as your key. 
and then it equals your value, right? So uh, let's make an inventory system here. My item is cheese, my price is 675, and the type of thing is fresh. Ah, oh, come in, I'm in there. Okay, so we first have the array of cheese and the price, and then later the employee goes and does in inventory comes along and plus equals onto that array to add an element, type equals fresh curds, right? If we want to copy that array, we can use declare dash n. That'll make an exact copy of that array into array two. And we can list the array keys with our indirect expansion uh, bang, and we can list array values by not including that. So let's see some of these. So declare dash a, a soak is my associative array, right? We have a port and a service. And then we're going to echo, so we're going to print some stuff. Right, so key is service, value is secure HTTP. Next key is port, next value is port, port two. Right, and that's just coming from my printf here. Uh, I did a little fancy business where I put in a new line and a couple spaces to indent, right? So if you want to take an array and print it in a user-friendly format or store data that way, right, this is kind of the way to get those keys and values. And all I'm doing here is looping over for key. Come on! Of keys with that bang there. Right. Like this so so ah. I can use that key the as the index me. of the associative array to bring out the value at that particular oh. array. Right. Now, unfortunately, there's not like a way to refer to items of an array. You would kind of need to break it out and go through it manually if you want to do it this way. Otherwise, you can take uh, items uh, basically uh, directly, but it's not. you can't treat them as such. Oh my gosh. You need to do it manually. But it is all there, and you can use those kinds of data structures, which is very handy sometimes. So we can do something called file sizes, is the name of our array. That's declared, it's done. Bash knows it's associative now, right? And then we can say for file and star, uh, if it is a regular file, dash f test, right? So that's to say it's not a directory, it's not a socket, it's not some weird stuff. Uh, then we're going to we're going to go ahead and add that uh, item to our array with the uh, size and bytes of the file as the value, and uh, the file name as the key. And then below that, I have a for loop that goes ahead and prints that out. What? So what? That the see that it did something. Shit. So I printed bytes, and then I gave a, a width so that everything lined up in a nice column, right? So you can do uh, quick things like this, uh, get you where you need to go. And uh, one thing that is good to know, declare dash p. Right, so declare dash p will print that all out all as one, and you can see my key equals my value and so forth. And this is a consumable form, basically. This is a command right here, so you could just take that and put it somewhere, which we'll see later. Uh, redirection, you're probably vaguely familiar with this at least. Uh, we have the, the pipe at the bottom there, which is... Uh, one of the things that really makes people see the power of uh, command line environments is being able to use the output of one program as the input to another, right? Um, it lets you automate work in a very seamless uh, way, uh, but there's other things we can do, right? We can take the output of a list of commands and put it in a file, or we can append it to a file, or we can read in from a file as input to commands. If not specified, file descriptor one, standard out is assumed when redirecting our output. So when you use a pipe, it's going to take standard out and throw it over the pipe unless you say otherwise. Yes? Uh, well, it depends. It depends on what's on the other side of the pipeline, right? Some things are going to barf on it, some things are going to discard them, some things are going to keep them. Um, like in general, if I pipe something to less, it might just be my distro's less settings, but it usually just loses the color format and I don't see all the weird codes. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. And in that case, it might be uh, it might be worth just throwing it in the set or something to just rip those things out. But. Some commands will be smart about what they're putting out to, but I know like on some distros I've gotten the stuff in less and some not, so it must be a less setting. But anyway, programs can be smarter or less smart about it. You need to know what what you're throwing over the pipe to be able to know how to deal with it, basically. Um, so for a couple quick examples of uh, redirection, we're going to take a few random numbers, uh, slices of them so that they're the same size, 
and then we're just going to print them and sort them. Right? So our printf is outputting directly into the sort program instead of to my screen, and then sort is putting stuff on my screen. Right? Here we're going to just do a whole bunch of pipes. We're going to man bash, and we're going to pipe the whole bash man page into tr, translate spaces into new lines to get the words. And, right? So we're going to basically just make a histogram here. Long story short, the appears 4170 times in the bash man page, is, this is the next most frequent, and so forth, right? So the most frequent word in there that's not just an article or something is a shell. Not surprising. And here, uh, this is something that a lot of people might get tripped up on. Echo B, echo A, sort, what do we expect? Not BA. Why did we get it? Yeah, yeah, we got no it. A uh, uh, so yeah. Right? So yeah. we're echoing B and then we're done. And then we're <laughs> echoing A in the sort. So here's where we need one of those group commands. It could be a subshell or not, right? As long as those are grouped, now that output is going together over the pipe. And we can actually get them sorted the way that we were thinking it would happen. Right? So just because something's on the same line doesn't mean it's together. And if we're uh, going to put something in a file, right, we can just use echo or something else that produces text and throw it into awesome.txt. And then we can use cat and we can go the other way with the, the less than sign to read from awesome.txt. Now, of course, we can also just cat awesome.txt, but that's just because cat's flexible. Right? It can take standard input when we're redirecting, or it can take a file name and go ahead and read it for us. Either way, right? But some commands only work one way or the other. But this way we can get uh, input and output from and to things uh, in a reasonable manner. So with that, we can get a little more advanced and do command substitutions off of our subshells or process substitutions. So these are always going to be subshells. These you can't do in the same uh, environment. Uh, so the command substitution replaces in line. So that's a way to build a command line out of a program's result. Like whatever that program does, it spits out a bunch of things, and that becomes the rest of your command line. It substitutes that whole expansion with the, the output of that command inside. Whereas process substitution is a way to treat the output of a command as a file, either for input or output to your, um, your command, whatever you're running. Um, so instead of replacing on the line, it just replaces it with a file descriptor, a path to a file descriptor, basically. So it acts like a file as far as the program is concerned. So if, if you have one of those really annoying programs that says, no, I need a literal file to work on, uh, usually you can get around it by just doing this if you wanted to use a pipe or something that they didn't want to let you do. Is it Sorry? Is it uh, depends on the environment. If it's uh, directly in, a, in an assignment, then um, it, you don't need to worry about the quoting, but otherwise you do. If you if you quote the, the whole substitution, then you will get proper words quoting. Um, so here we have an example. We're going to run a command date plus percent %f, so we want to get a date in a nice format. That will give us our file name based on the date, and then we're going to echo things into it, which are also expansions. So here we just have a few expansions going on. Uh, we slept a second, right? And so now we can... Uh, get file Boah, name. Den sugar cane farm gesehen. And, uh, Der war MLG. Yeah. Our file name is actually file 2017-0506. <coughs> That's control all the if you want to expand the value directly on the command line. Uh, if we want to see some more examples of this, um, here we have the substitution in line on the command line. And then uh, this is a special case where you can take a file name and it's kind of like a, a cat, basically. Uh, instead of saying cat file name inside the expansion, you can just use the, the arrow. It looks a little confusing, but saves a couple uh, keystrokes. Lol, ich war ganz gerade. Oh, because they're inside the, the expansion. So that's already a protected zone. Bash knows about what's going on in there, so you don't need to get crazy double, triple, quadruple escaping everything inside. You can just go full transparent there, which is very nice. Um, just like here, right? So here we can show that we're actually running these all in subshells, right? So in, in the very middle, I'm saying, uh, give me the uh, process tree for everything from uh, the current shell that I'm in, but that's after I'm already a few levels deep, right? So it, it gives me the whole tree 
with my PS all the way at the bottom here on the inside. Now the other way to do it is with back ticks and there we don't have protection and we do have to escape and it's really awful. <laughs> and I really, really highly advise against ever using back ticks. There's no reason. Back ticks are the same as the dollar per end, uh, except that they make things much dirtier and harder to read and it's not, you know, they're they're the same on both ends instead of being matched, so it's just visually it's harder to parse and if you want to nest them it just gets bad. Uh, so we can go ahead and take this uh, as a file in the path. And here what we see is that our echo path, uh, when it was expanded, became a file descriptor, dev at d63. Right? So if we didn't want to see that in the output, we could go ahead and tell WC to take that as a, on its standard input instead of giving it, presenting it as a file. So Bash will just go ahead and take from that file descriptor and then put it through the thing anyway. Right? So. Um, you can do uh, anything that you need. You can be flexible with respect to what you want the program that you're ultimately calling to run. And so here we have an example where we're going into instead of out of the process substitutions. TAC is like cat but in reverse, right? So we're doing TAC and then in another one we're sleeping and then we're doing cat. So that's why we get it backwards, three, four, two, one, and then one, two, three, four. And that's that's using T to fork out Hello the same can tech, uh, text to both of those programs. What the fuck? So if, uh, T is a good way to uh, basically, yeah, um, it's like a splitter, right? And we can do that all inside a variable, and now it's saved as a variable. Same difference. And we didn't need to quote it because that's a special case in assignment. We didn't need to put quotes around this batch notes to keep that all together properly for us. And we can go ahead and fill up an array like this. Hi, hello there, so forth. And then when we look at the array with declared HP, we see that everything is in its proper place. Uh, it will not work this way. Array not found. Why? Because on the right-hand side of a pipe is a subshell. So this while loop is inside a protected subshell where uh, everything's locally scoped. And so this whole array that we're building here gets thrown out completely by the time we need to use it down here. So what you need to do is instead take, take the input in the other way, and then we can have it in our shell fine, right? So here, crucially, the difference is that while is not on the other side of a pipe anymore, it's in our current shell. So when we're setting this array here, it actually is meaningful after we're done. So the difference there, basically, instead of having the pipe, uh, which you can't see because of the size, so yeah. we won't put those side by side. I'm sorry, you get the point. This is how we do diffs, right? I'm using an, an array of examples actually to bring these up so quick instead of doing all the typing. Um, and so that's Ooh, how uh, me do those things basically. But we only have a few minutes left, so we'll try to move on. Functions, we're getting the good stuff here, right? So function name compound command, right? So any of those compound commands we saw before can be functions. Usually people just use the uh, curly braces to designate functions, but you can also just do function and go right into a for loop. Ooh, lava. Uh, and redirections will apply permanently. So let's see a few of these real quick and then see some of these actions. So words I is going to be a function that echoes words. Uh, so this words, one, two, three, four, uh, three, four. Okay, come, this wird jetzt. So now we can abstract our code and call it things. We can reverse characters. Uh, I won't go through all these examples in full details so that we get through, but we uh, can cars hello and we get all that. Right? We can take that function rev okay, card Leute, that we just made and put it in another list that says rev words. And, and now I can say rev words hello, hi there. Uh, right. Ja, so ich weiß, so das Video dauert noch uh, sicher 10 Minuten oder so, aber ja, das schaue ich alleine weiter. Um, oder fertig, ehrlich gesagt, das kann man ja nicht weiter schauen, denn ups. Okay, Leute, um, das war Lasergucklend, der gerade erreichbare Server mit der, steht die IP schon da, ganz oben, hier oben steht die IP, ich schreibe sie nochmal hin. Um, alternativ gibt es auch die Domain, unter der man den Server momentan erreichen kann. Ähm, 
Genau, und da hieß er aber ohne Regeln. Das Video, was wir geschaut haben, war Concise New Bash an Introduction to uh, Advanced Usage von James Panner Culey vom Linux Fest Northwest 2017. Links wie immer in der Beschreibung. Also bitte auf der Microsoft Server joinen und hier spielen, weil der Server ist leer und ich zahle dafür. Uh, let's go!